thinking through issues of avoidance. So a lot of times what happens is that we have this thing going on where, we, where we're avoiding an emotion and avoiding emotion for different reasons and as a result of that we finish up getting these problems uh, through the avoidance process and um, You just reminded me that a key thing that you said yesterday when you're going through all the steps of things that you can do to yep. get into the emotions is when you said I'm allowed to feel my fear because that's what's been shut down and I felt it open the minute that you said that. Yeah. It's just that allowance of, of, um, of being allowed to as well as wanting to that made yeah. a difference. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Joy, um, some of the things that uh, I would like to talk a little about yesterday uh, first before we start and that is that uh, yesterday you may have noticed that the first 15 or 20 minutes or so most of you felt quite like flat. You notice that? And the reason for that was there was a very heavy spirit projection from the spirit world. There's a group of uh, very uh, angry spirits who follow me around now um, trying to shut down anybody who talks to me. And, uh, and so you'll notice at the start of every new group that we do there's almost that 15 or 20 minute like of real heavy like everyone feels like going to sleep type uh, thing going on and the majority of that is coming from some spirits who are, uh, there's quite a few million of them who, who basically just project all of their rage and anger and uh, at, the gr at anybody who's listening, at any, any group and of course at myself and what they, what they are trying to do uh, through this process is actually stop the growth of any of this kind of work on earth so that's their intention. The reason why they intend to do that is because they can see that anything that grows here on earth where people change and start recognizing connections with spirits and so forth, that it actually disconnects them from what, you know, their addictions, their earth-based addictions. And so some of these uh, spirits can get quite nasty at times and there's a whole group of different types of religions doing it as well. So, um, so there's different types of spirits in different religious backgrounds who are also projecting these heavy emotions at the start of every group. And what their intention is, and you'll notice at the start of the group yesterday too, I had all that microphone problems as well and eventually we couldn't use a mic, uh, one of the mics and all those kind of things. And all of those things are the result of this heavy, heavy projection that's coming. Now the question that we need to ask ourselves is, why are we so influenced by it? Do you see why that we need to ask that question? Why are we so influenced by heavy projections of anger and rage coming from the spirit world? Now the only answer can be that we have this conciliatory emotion inside of ourselves. That whenever anybody is angry or, or upset with us, that it means we're wrong. Or that it means we're bad. Or it means we're... Or, or even that we just want to get away from it and not stay in truth. And so that's an emotion that we need to look at within ourselves. Because this group of spirits who are projecting these things at us won't have the same effect on us. They're still here today with us today and already there's a better energy by, you know, because of me even just speaking about the reality of what's going on. And they're here pretty much now at every group. So the key is for you to work through the emotions of that. So when, when you're feeling that feeling of, oh, boy, this is a bit hard, you know, like, gee, AJ seems to be extra boring today, like, <laughs> that kind of emotion, you know. The key is to allow yourself to feel what's going on inside of you and it just allow yourself to be cognizant, uh, even intellectually, that there is a lot of things around you projecting at, there are a lot of things around you projecting at you and it's not just the people that are here. It's also the people who are in spirit that are, that are here too. Now that being said, there's also large groups of spirits who are here because they want to learn truths as well. And there's also a large group of spirits who are here who are very, really appreciative of all the things that they're learning. So, so they're not the only spirits here, but at the moment, unfortunately, because they uh, have this uh, feeling that if they don't shut me down now it might grow too large at some point that they actually can't shut down at all. 
And so that's why many of you also are finding yourself getting quite a bit of spirit attack um, after you've come to learn the truth. And when I say spirit attack, a lot of it's uh, uh, dis uh, displayed to you through different methods. And one of the methods uh, is that you'll get distracted a lot from truth through in your life. So you have a lot of things happening where, where you seem to get busier now that we're talking about this stuff. Or, you know, your life seems to get busier and it's harder to get to a group. It's harder to, to actually talk to other people who are on the path because you just don't have as much time. And it, and it seems that lots of different things are taking up your time that wouldn't normally be taking up your time. So the key is to ask yourself, all right, if those things are happening, have a look at how much of these things that are happening might be influenced by things outside of you. And then have a look at the emotion inside of you that causes you to go down the track of following things that you don't really want to be doing anymore. So have a look at those kind of emotions as well within you. So I wanted to mention that because yesterday it was quite noticeable. That's why Mary came up with me yesterday. And I, was, I was happy that she did. Um, because um, it was really hard uh, feeling the projection of these large groups of spirit and then feeling you as an audience feeling quite depleted because of that uh, emotional projection. And then my energy is trying to overcome not only this group of spirits but also the audience going into this state, you see. And so um, what I'm trying to do more and more now is call the spirits on what they're doing right at the start of a group rather than uh, halfway through the group. And that way we'll all get more out of it, including the spirits who are projecting these things at us. And the other thing today that I wanted to mention is um, what's our major topic that we've been discussing the entire time that I've been talking with you for the last two years now? Love. Love, okay. How are you going reflecting it in your life? That's the issue I'd like to, to actually ask you. Because it, it, there's little point in coming along to groups where we talk about love, where we're not actually now sort of looking at applying the love in our lives. It's sort of like a bit of a waste of time, if, if, if you think about it that way. What's the point? What will happen eventually, and I've talked to you about this before, is that you'll have more and more and more truth about love in your mind, and unless something shifts emotionally, you're going to feel very bad every time you come to one of these groups. And that's one of the reasons why some of the groups get quite small at times, because everyone's feeling quite depleted when they come, because they're feeling quite judgmental, and they're feeling quite judgmental because they know they're not acting upon what they've already heard. Does that make sense? Now, you can choose to do whatever you wish, and I'm perfectly happy to have a, a, a hundred people in the audience who don't practice anything to do with love. Um, obviously, um, I'm going to talk about love whether that happens or not. But the thing to look at within yourself is why would I not choose to actually put love into action in my life? And there can only be one reason when you think about it. And what do you think that might be? One emotion. Fear. Fear is the emotion. And so whenever you notice yourself not being love or not being in truth, always look at your fears. Always address your fears. And it's your fears that cause you to not reflect love. Now today we're doing the second part, if you like, of our discussion yesterday, which was the human relationships relationship with a partner, session two, if, if we could call it that. And today, um, what we want to do is address some issues with regard to emotions and addictions, uh, because it's one of the major things that we need to finish up talking about. So that will be our focus today. Does anyone not have a handout? Someone who wasn't here yesterday? I'll just... We've only got about 10 or so left, I think, haven't we? Covered? 
Awesome. Okay. Uh, we're going to do the roving mics today, myself and Mary. We're finding uh, there's two reasons why that's the case. One is that we find that when we ask for roving mics to be done, very few people want to be involved with it. And then the people that are involved with it don't have an attitude of service. So what we want to do is address those two issues with you as well. Now, some of you are afraid right, to actually have a mic in your hand and give it to somebody and some of you do it because you're afraid of missing out on something but everything's recorded and taped so you're not going to miss out on anything and some of you are, uh, also have this emotion where you're willing to please me but you forget one thing that I said in the first century which I want to say today and that is that if you can't please or, or serve the smallest person in your own eyes then you really can't please or serve God or myself. Does that make sense? So unless you're in a state where you can actually serve each other, we're not yet really reflecting love. And when I say serve each other, I'm not saying that you have to compromise yourself to serve. I'm saying having a desire to serve. And so what often happens is we get a mic in our hand and there'll be emotions in us of, oh, now I'm doing it, now I'm getting the approval from AJ, hopefully, and, but that's not the whole reason for doing it. We do it because we love our friends. Do you know what I mean? And it's the same, if you can think about that, why you actually serve others. What is the underlying emotional reason why you serve others? Why you do things for them? And so what I want to do today um, I did this quite a few times in the first century, by the way, where I served my friends. And I'm going to serve you today, and Mary's going to serve you today. And that's why we've changed the way the videos are working, so they can pan around, and we can actually come to you in the audience when you ask a question, and you'll actually be on the camera while, you, while it's happening. And I Raise can your hand you. if you're too good. <laughs> so who's triggered by this change? Yeah, there, got it. <laughs> Only a few, that's all right. And so... Um, the beauty of doing that too is if you can ask yourself uh, this question. Why do I believe that some people are more important to me than others? Why do I serve some and not others? Right. And you know what you'll come up with as an answer eventually? It's because of an emotion you get back from the service with some and not others. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about now, in your relationships. The issue of... Now, you notice we're skipping through some of the bits of our outline, but the issue of addictions. All right. Shall we do an example of what happened this morning at, how, at our house? Does that sound all right with you, guys? Okay. Um, well, I start. You want to start? Well, yeah. you were there. I wasn't there at the first bit. <laughs> um, I I had a really big realization in the last month about myself, and it's about um, I guess the hooks that I have into everyone else around me, what I want to get from people around me. So. A lot of my life I've tried to look after everyone else's emotions around me so that I feel like a nice person and a good girl and I'm important and all these things. And as a part of that, um, what I would do would be I would be most responsive to people who are projecting the most at me because I can feel that stronger and I want them to feel, feel good about themselves so I would, I would try and make everyone else feel good. And what happened in my relationship with AJ is that not only did I have some anger that I hadn't dealt with, some causal anger with him, which made me dismissive of him, essentially, yeah. he also never projected anything at me. No need, no make me feel better feeling was ever coming from AJ. He was always off feeling his emotions. So what happened for us in our relationship is that I would we'd get into a social situation and I'd be trying to look after Anna and Raya and Brian and Mike and Tristan and Anna and, and I'd never think about AJ at all. 
So he ended up feeling quite unloved, which he was in that situation, um, and I would feel exhausted by social situations. <laughs> And all the time trying to get this feeling like I'm a nice person, I'm loved, and if, if, uh, if these three guys didn't give me any attention then I'd feel like, oh, they don't love me and I feel terrible and I might even get angry about that. So that was a huge realisation that I had. And I realised how ingrained it was and how I would do it without even realising what I was doing. And when I realised about it, I felt really kind of a bit... Um, it was a bit sleazy really, I felt quite dirty, like oh, I've been in this sort of a false exchange with everyone, I was looking after their injuries, they were looking after my injuries and there was nothing real in our interactions. So that was a really big realisation, this is the history, <laughs> really big realisation for me to have a little while ago and since then I've been very conscious of when I start to slip back into the pattern and I've also started to feel really sensitive to people's projections at me. So this morning what happened was, uh, we're staying with James and Paula and Mike is also a guest there. And I came downstairs to make breakfast for AJ and myself, AJ was in the shower. And um, I said to Mike, how are you doing Mike? He said, well I've got this emotion going on and oh, I'm not really sure what it's about and all of this kind of thing. And immediately I, Mike's a man who's not feeling that good, so my old pattern is I've got to make Mike feel and I, I didn't do that. I went, oh, well, I guess you could do this and that. And I got on with making the smoothie. Then James came in. And I said, how are you doing, James? Well, I've got a lot of stuff going on. And so, but he wasn't, neither guy was actually feeling their stuff. They were telling me the story of the stuff, which was all about women, incidentally. Um, and so, once again, I resisted the temptation to, to make, or to, to try and make James feel better because I wouldn't essentially be making him feel better if I did all of my usual things like, oh, you'll get it, James, or don't worry, you're a lovely guy. And all. So I didn't say any of that. <laughs> I just went, oh, okay, and got on with doing my breakfast. Then I made breakfast and I sat down. And AJ came down and he was busy, do he transfers all the sound recording onto his computer and the video and all of that the night before he comes here either the night before or this morning. So he was finishing up that whole big job and I said to him, ah, babe, would it be all right if I check my emails? Like, the internet isn't connected on this, um, on, <laughs> on this laptop. He went, oh yeah. I said, don't do it if it's a big deal. Like, I just, you know, I just sort of wanted to. And he said, no, no, that's okay, I'll do it. Meanwhile, Mike had been looking at some stuff on his computer and, and I sat down, I was drinking my smoothie and I went, oh, actually, Mike, if you've got it set up, maybe I could just look on your computer. He went, yeah, yeah, no worries. So he opened his computer, but it was turned off and I didn't realise, so he turned, it, he turned it on. I said, oh, don't do it if it's a big deal. <laughs> At that point, AJ quite did. <laughs> so I said to Mary, um, what you've just done is very unloving, actually. Now most of you would have gone, what, what, what's going on here? What she's doing is following her desire. And I said, but babe, you're already doing something. If it's already set up on Mike's computer, it's much better, you know, you've got stuff to do. So then we had a little bit of a discussion between ourselves. And, and by the way, Mike and James were sitting enclosed in this discussion because they were in, the way the set, settee was arranged was that there was Mike and James trapped in the corner. And, and then there's myself and Mary interacting with each other. Now, Mary starts, I start sort of talking to Mary about what was the underlying motive of why she actually wanted to check her emails. Right? Sorry? Yeah, I won't explain why it was. I'll just explain what happened in terms of leading up to it. And so I started to just talk to her about the fact that actually she wasn't considerate of me when she asked me um, to use the computer because if she was, she would know that I was busy on the computer and, and, you know, if she was considerate, she would have just gone straight to another computer and, and used that because there was quite a number of computers in the house that could have been used, right? But she came to mine for a reason and she wasn't looking at that reason. And so we had anyway a bit of a discussion and during the discussion I was quite firm. Now, James and, and Michael were just projecting all of this shutdown at me. Like, that was just like... they. Were, Mary was pretty good. Like Mary was just sort of, you know, trying to reason with me that she, she didn't see what I was getting at. 
But Mike and James were just like, whoa, like, you know, you shut up, AJ. Like, you gotta stop, you got to stop aggroing the woman, otherwise, you know. <laughs> because I was saying things like, no, really, I feel like I was considering you, and is it wrong for me to want to check my emails? Aren't I following my desire? I don't want you, you know, all this stuff all this is stuff. going on. Yeah. Anyway, so, so I said, no, I'm not saying any more now. That's the end of this discussion. I'm not saying any more. And I said to Mike, I don't want to use your computer anymore because I need to go and feel my emotions. And, I, and, then I said to the, and then I said to the guys, now, you were projecting at me more than what Mary was right at that moment as well. And, and we started having a discussion about that. But, but what happened during the discussion is Mary went up to the room. She totally believed that I was in a bad space this morning. Right? That was the original feeling, wasn't it? That, well, the feeling was... I was very misunderstood yeah. and AJ, well, he does have some emotions going on today so you know, I need to just go away and look at this but I really don't think that he's got a point here. Yeah. I wasn't angry which is like a big hooray for me, usually I would have felt quite angry. Well, I was fine but I thought no I can't see his point. Yeah. So when you went up into the room, what happened there? So when I, was, I went up there and sat on the bed and went, no, he's definitely wrong. Oh, I can't see this. And then I went, hang on, why did I want to check my email? Because really, AJ said he would open his, com or he would set it up on his computer when he was done. But I, I still wanted to do it. Urgently. Well, it didn't feel <laughs> urgent to me. I, th I thought I was being quite casual about it. But the fact was, I then went to Mike and went, well, can, you, can I do it on your computer? <laughs> and I realised the emotion that I was having was I was sitting there drinking my smoothie and there was two guys right next to me who weren't feeling their stuff and I wasn't going to make them feel better but that felt really bad for me. So I wanted to avoid this whole situation by checking my emails. So, so what we finished up doing was having a discussion about addictions as a result of that. What addictions were being kicked off in each person. So, so for Mary, it's great now that Mary's work, working way through this emotion of actually not following the normal addictive behaviour, which was, because she's dealt with the underlying causal emotion, she's not following a normal addictive behaviour. When there's a sad man around, cheer him up, right? So she's not doing that anymore. But because now she's not doing it, the projection coming from the man is so overwhelmingly painful to her and she's not recognising how painful at times it is to her, although you do at times, don't you? You feel it at times. And in that interaction, all she wants to do is get away from it, do anything to get away from it. Does that make sense? Even if do anything means be unloving to myself to get away from it, right? And that's where I, I'm okay with her doing anything to get away from it. I'm not okay with the unloving to me and getting away from it. Does that make sense? And then we talked with the guys about the emotional hooks that were there into Mary, trying to get Mary. Because both of them were dealing with different emotional issues about women and do, what was going on. Do you feel brave enough to talk about your emotions that you were feeling? Yeah? No, you do want, you want? Do you want it? Yeah, I, only if you want it. <laughs> <laughs> so what were you feeling like? So when I was having this discussion with Mary, what were you feeling? Um, massively uncomfortable. I felt really, um, yeah, I found it hard to be there. I felt the feelings that I had were that you were being quite unfair to Mary and uh -huh. I wanted to defend Mary. So you wanted um, to defend Mary? I was being unfair to Mary? Yeah. Yep. Um, and intellectually I knew you'd be right, but I really couldn't feel that. Yeah, and so, so there's a conflict there as well. So you thought, usually AJ's been right when I've, t when I've talked to him about my emotions, but in this situation it doesn't seem like he's right, really. Well, I've had that before. <laughs> where, like, I know in, like, in confrontational situations where I feel really confronted. Yeah. Um, because I know intellectually you're right, I'm not going to emotionally shut you down and try and act out on the feeling that I've got. But yep. at the same time, I'm caught in this real discomfort of... This is not fair to Mary. I need to defend Mary. Yep. Why are you attacking her almost? Yep. And like that kind of feeling. So yeah. that, was quite, that was quite hard to sit in. And then when you left, uh, both myself and James were just sitting there like, <laughs> <laughs> Sort of what just happened? And then, and then I said to both the guys, you've been projecting at me far more stronger negative emotions than Mary has during this interaction. So what are your feelings? So what was your feelings? You felt, you felt like you really wanted me to stop. That was really the end of the day. Yeah, it just... Um, I guess the feeling is that I felt that you were making Mary unhappy. Yeah. And I wanted you to stop doing that. Yeah. 
Um, and that relates to a, a thing that happened about a week ago. So I'll, I'll raise those yeah. things with Mike because what happened at home, Mike's been staying with us for a few weeks from England and he's been doing a lot of work for himself emotionally down in one of our eco tents. And, and, um, and so he'd come up to the house, you know, get triggered usually, then go back down to the tent, deal with some stuff, come back to the house, get triggered, go back. So it's sort of like a fairly regular pattern of going up and down between the house. And, and we all do that, myself and Mary too. And anyway, myself and Mary had, uh, Mary had had a really good day because what had happened is she'd, she'd processed some really deep emotions for her the previous day, felt really euphoric, really, hey, um, you yeah. felt that day, like really happy. Um, at last getting to even, It wasn't thought. even the day. I'd processed for like nearly two days straight really uh, stuff and then at night I just went, wow, yeah. I feel amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so she was feeling really high, right? Um, now before all this happened, of course, there was a fair bit of anger coming my way, so I wasn't feeling that high, right? <laughs> And, and so well, not necessarily those two days, probably the two months two before, prior yeah, to those. Yeah, that's right. So, so, um, so Mary's feeling really high and then, and then there's a projection at me that I feel high along with her. Does that make sense? So in other words, that I feel happy that she's happy now. Well, I, I just want to be happy. Let's be happy. Yeah, okay. So, so, and I, and so I sat down, Mary, and down and I said to her, actually, you're projecting at me that I should be happy when I don't actually feel that happy. I can see you're happy and it's great and I like that you've worked through the emotion, but it's been after two months of pretty harsh emotions coming at me, right? At which point I went, oh, you're right. So he, she then went into this real sad sort of started remorseful going Remorseful kind of. A bit remorseful. Mike got triggered something full on. He was sitting listening to this conversation, right? We're, everything's open at home and when you, if ever you come out, you'll find that uh, if myself and Heaven Mary are talking, whatever it is, we talk about it generally in front of whoever's there. So one thing you'll have to get used to if you come out, right? Anyway, so Mike just gets up and says, I, I'm, I'm having a struggle here. I'm going down the tent, you know? And it's the same emotion, wasn't it? This emotion yeah. of wanting to protect Mary. I should be making Mary happy. She's happy. Keep the woman in the happy place, you know? Mm. Keep the woman in the happy place. The happy yeah. place is a great place for the woman, right? <laughs> right? And the reason why is, what was the underlying emotional reason? Um. To keep the woman in the happy place. What, what was happening inside of you if the woman gets out of the happy place? Um. Struggling to remember that. Um, mine's gone. Um, I guess the feelings were um, that I don't want any anger projected at me, is one thing. So, one is a prevention of anger? Yeah. What happens uh, though when the woman is projecting anger at you? I don't what, feel loved. You don't feel loved. So, what are you wanting from the woman really? To feel loved. To feel loved. So, so when the woman's in a happy place, that's when you're feeling loved, the yeah. most love, right? And if the woman, and it doesn't matter which woman around you is in a happy place, then everything feels good for you. That's the addiction. Do you see that? That's the hook. That's the hook into the transaction. So now, what happens is, every time Mike's with a woman who's angry, he's got to make her feel good, no matter what. Because if she's angry, it means he's feeling unloved. So you can see, what we finish up doing is we finish up going down the track usually of saying, oh, I'm feeling this because of some childhood emotion with my mum and, you know, I was never loved by a woman and blah, 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 and we go down all this, this stuff, you know, this explanation. And a lot of it's true. Like, a lot of it is true. We weren't loved by a mother when we were young and all these different things are very true. But you know what we're ignoring? We're ignoring our addiction, right? And what we've got to start doing in relationships, and this is part of becoming totally responsible emotionally, what we've got to do in relationships is start seeing our addictions as an oppressive projection at our partner. So our addiction is an oppressive projection at our partner. So a lot of times we feel like anger is an oppressive projection, right? Most of us would agree that if you're feeling somebody angry with you, it feels really oppressive. You know, you feel like backing off, don't you? So it feels oppressive. But when I am actually needing them to stop being angry, that's also an oppressive projection back at them. Does that make sense? 
There's a reason for that underlying and a reason and addiction and that is I want them to be happy with me. And so, you know, you can project as much being sad as you can being angry. And you can manipulate people around you as much being sad or ashamed or guilty as you can being angry with a person. And this is something that we've got to start seeing in our relationships, you see. If we start seeing the addiction, the hook that we have into the relationship and what we're wanting from the other person, once we start operating in harmony with divine love, we will start owning the underlying emotion of that addiction. So remember, every addiction covers an underlying emotion. Does everyone understand what AJ means when he says even your sadness can be an oppressive uh, projection? No, I no. got that. Yeah. Well, let's say, let's, let's say I'm sad. Now, there's two ways of feeling my sadness. One is I own it and I feel it, which means I'll actually be crying. Right? The other way is to go into this real morose, sort of like depressive state. You know? What is happening there is everyone around you is feeling your depressed state and you're using it to control everyone around you. Does that make sense? That's the difference. So if you're a man who just feels sad and thinks, oh, I just want, I just want a woman to love me, and you're, then along comes a woman like me <laughs> who goes, I want a man to feel good about himself so I can feel good about me, we can form a really lovely relationship where I look after his sadness, he makes me feel special because I do it, and back and forth. And what's happening at the soul level is there's these emotions, these emotional hooks passing back and forth. And actually in the spirit world, and this is why I wanted to bring it up in terms of what, looking, what it looks like in the spirit world, it actually looks like a hook into another person. So every one of the spirits who are with us who are thinking about their emotional issues, they need to see that, it, that it, they can actually recognise it as this, it's actually a stream of energy that flows out of the soul through the spirit body out of the spirit and into the other person's damage and then their energy flows out as a hook into your damage and while that circular thing is going on you're going to be bound together there's going to be an attraction going on I actually had a vision sort of when I had this big realization about what I do with everyone which was it really helped me connect with my grief about how I what I had been doing all my life because what I, I got this vision given to me of like I'm like a big amoeba basically there's no me and there's just parts of me going into every single person and then their stuff's coming into me which and that's what I've created by wanting all of our addictions satisfied and that's what that's how I got that really ooh, dirty feeling like I'm mixing energy and I, there's no me there's me and my desire and my self in there and the way you know that you've got these hooks is that you will feel people change towards you moment by moment. So one of the ways Re Mary recognised it was that there was an ex-boyfriend who projected anger at her and she knew it the instant it occurred. So therefore there's still the hook. Does that make sense? Still the hook into the person and still the hook coming back. It was really powerful. Um, what happened was... Um, I. Oh, Facebook, isn't it the most wonderful invention in the world? But anyway, I was friends with my ex-boyfriend on Facebook and um, I had been, we'd broken up two years ago and I don't visit his page or we don't have any communication. But this one day I just, real, I, I thought, no, nah, I, I, I'm not his friend on Facebook and sure enough I checked and he'd removed me as a friend. And, and I said this to AJ, I said, I just, I just knew, Hassan had, I just somehow knew it. And um, of course, then AJ went, you still got hooks into your ex-boyfriend if you're feeling that. Um, and then it hit me like, a fr like really, really powerfully that I could do that with everyone I know. I can feel what they feel about me. Like that because of this, not in a good psychic wow way, like because I'm hooked, to anyone I'm hooked into, I can feel what they're feeling about me at any time. So then Mary made this list of people of all of her friends and family and all the people who knew her and everything and she could tell me right at that moment what every single one of them was feeling towards her and then what she was trying to give them back if there was anything going back. 
right? And that felt awful. Yeah. So you, you can imagine what that makes you feel like. It makes you feel like you're just a person who doesn't have a life anymore. All you're doing is giving out all this energy to other people, you know, to get things back. And so what Mary often feels, one of the big core emotions that she's actually felt so strongly, is this really strong emotion that exhaustion of having to give out all the time, this terrible feeling of exhaustion. And it comes from these hooks, these emotional hooks that we have in each other. Now the biggest emotional hooks you will generally have is the hooks you have with your partner. All right? And this is why it's so important to look at the issues with your partner. So what we want to do, you notice in the last two pages of the uh, handout, there's a section at the back. And the section at the back is, uh, the last two pages is just a list of different addictions and how the addictions get set up and what kind of interactions occur. And then we talk about on the divine love path, what we would do to, to sort of smash those addictions, if you like, to get rid of those addictions. So what we wanted to do is to talk with you now about some of these interrelationship addictions that we have and what we can do to actually get rid of them if we're on the divine love path. What we do on the natural love path is often we feed into them. So what we often do on the natural love path is, you know, my, my husband has to show an interest in me. If he doesn't show an interest in me, then he doesn't love me, right? That's our automatic assumption. Now, we might be right, but we're not looking at our own addiction. And so what we often do there is we say, oh, I'm going to go and get myself a man or a woman who does love me. So we get run off, not fixing the addiction, and so what kind of a man or a woman are we going to attract? Exactly the same person. Exactly the same person in a different body and a different face, same person. They'll have some other emotional injuries of different type, but they'll have this same injury where they will treat me eventually like they don't care about me because I still haven't dealt with my addiction. You see, we are addicted to certain things, including we are addicted to often to not being treated well. We can be even addicted to that. So we need to look at our addictions. So let's have a look at some of them. So the first one is... Uh, if I have the core beliefs that I'm never safe and love will make me feel safe, love in adverted comments there, inverted comments. Yeah, we all, I'm always putting love in, in commas when I'm saying what I believe love to be, but it might not be, right? So, so what's my addiction? If my partner loves me, my past partner must always make me feel safe. That's my addiction. So the core belief is I actually am never safe. The underlying emotion I need to connect to is I don't have any safety in this world. That's the underlying emotion I need to connect to. And if it's towards a man, then I don't have any safety in this world with men. Does that make sense? Or if I'm a woman, I might have it in a bit of a different way. I don't have any safety in this world because I'm a woman. And I need a man to make, you know, to create a safe haven for me. Now, historically, you can see how this injury could have entered, right? How many times have women been raped and abused and harmed historically, and even currently, of course, but historically it's been even worse right the way through the generations. And so what happens is a woman feels safe unless there's a big, strong man there to protect her, right? And that big, strong man has to be usually a bit of, a, bit of an angry man because if he's an angry man, then he might punch the other guy in the nose who's trying to get at her. Or, you know what I mean? So she's looking for a specific type of man in order to make herself feel safe. So an addiction is, my partner has to make me feel safe. And if he's making me feel safe, I'm loved. I think this is how bad boys got popular. <laughs> Can you understand that? Who, who's going to you know, defend you? Isn't it the bad boy who's going to punch someone in the nose for you? Right? And this is often how the bad boys get... Pretty women are walking with gorillas down my street. You know, that kind of thing. And <laughs> because what was, what's happening is we're... I, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to burst into song more often <laughs> the way I'm going. <laughs> And I'm not saying that I'm a very good singer, it just, is, it just it can't help it. Um, but what happens is we, we finish up focusing on the addiction, and if now the addiction doesn't get satisfied, what happens? 
Well, often a mo- woman might feel angry with her man because he's because she's feeling unsafe, and she's feeling unsafe, feels the fear, doesn't want to feel the fears, instead kicks into anger and tells him off. You did that. You, you know, I wasn't safe when you did that. You know, and goes into that space. So let's look at how, how I've listed here. Firstly, the core belief: I am not safe. Never safe. I'm insecure. You know, I'm not safe and secure as a woman. My addiction. My partner loves me. If my partner loves me, they'll always make me feel safe. My projection is: if I want, if my partner wants my love, I have to firstly feel they make me safe. So can you see why you're never going to be attracted to a man who triggers you all the time into that state? Because he's not making you feel safe, is he? Right. So you're not going to feel very attracted to a man who's not making you feel safe. So what do you do instead? You say, oh, he's not making me feel safe. You go and find another man who <laughs> makes you feel safe. Now that first man might be honest, have integrity, have character, have a lot of really good qualities that you just skip all over because he wasn't making you feel safe when he called you on something. Does that make sense? Oh, I'll do that. Um, where did I put the other one? Oh, with Mike. Where is? Wouldn't that only just work if you have that need about safety? So if you don't have that operating about men make me feel safe because I don't, I don't believe I do, mm-hmm. then it wouldn't, it, it kind of would be not applicable, wouldn't it? Exactly. That's exactly. why if you deal with the core belief. Yeah, because you don't have the core belief, so it was not, this particular emotion is not applicable to you. Okay. Also, I have another question about projections. I'm not really sure, and I'm also um, worried now <laughs> that I'm exposed, as yeah. everyone would be. Yeah. When you talk about projections, and yesterday you mentioned it, AJ, that, um, oh, well, you often mention it, that people project at you. Yep. Is that that you can pick up on whatever we feel, or is it, a, yes. a, is it, is it only if we want you to know that, or... Libby, you... you <laughs> That's why you feel so nervous when you talk to me a lot of times. Uh, not that I'm aware of, yeah. but... Um, so, how do you both know what all of us feel and think. And does that mean that we can know what everyone else feels and thinks as well? Yes, yes. to both. And you already do it more than you realise. You're realize. already doing it. Okay. This is, is what we want to get at with the addictions. Through, because the addictions are demonstrating you're already doing it, you're just not conscious of it. Right? You see, what ha- what's happening to every single person in this, in this hall is you've got emotional injuries coming out of you. They're coming out of your soul. Every single person here is feeling them. Every single person. Now, the problem for most of us is that we also have emotional injury. So your emotional injury comes out of your soul and it flies through the atmosphere, right? Looking for a hook, looking for a solution, looking for some kind of salving of the emotion, you know, some kind of panacea that's going to help everything, right? And it's coming out of, the, it's coming out of you. And every single person here if they're open to it, and even often if they're not open to it, we'll start feeling it. But they're only going to feel it to the extent that their own emotional injuries react to it. So, my, so your emotional projection might be, I, I, want to, I want somebody, and in this case that we're just example, the example is, I want a man to make me feel secure. Now if my emotional injury happens to be that I'm looking for women who want to feel secure, so that when I make them feel secure, they make me feel loved, I will hook into your hook. Does that make sense? I will hook into your emotional injury. And and this is all happening at the soul level. And all of a sudden, I just feel drawn to you. Oh, I feel drawn to you, Libby. I just feel drawn to you. Like, oh, Libby. And you you just feel so drawn to some people. Does that make sense? And so because we feel so drawn to them, what's actually happening unbeknown to us intellectually at this point, is we're feeling drawn by this con- these compatible injuries together. Now you've all noticed this at times, right? In, in quite strong ways in your own relationships and your own friendships and so forth. Why is it you walk up to one woman, you're a woman, you walk up to one woman, you just don't like her for some reason, right? And you look at her, no, there's nothing wrong with Ray and how she looks, you know, it's just... 
she, she, she's no different really than anyone else to look at, like in the sense that, no, and I don't mean that to negatively, I'm sure Brian feels you're a much better than every other woman <laughs> to look at. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I, I'm, I don't feel like, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with you, but mm, I just don't feel good with this. Right? Why does that happen? Because you're already sensitive at the emotional level to what's going on within Raya and within yourself, and the two are incompatible hooks. They are incompatible with each other that we, and, we, and we feel repulsed by each other as a result of that rather than attracted. Does that make sense? This is what happens with addictions. What happens when you start to clear out your emotions is a little bit different because then you become more sensitive to what everyone's projecting um, and instead of... Feed, like for me, I was feeding into a lot of people's addictions without even knowing I was doing it because I was so hooked into the process. I would have really good friends and we were just patting each other's back in our addictions. But as you start to clear out the reason why that happens, then a little bit like what happened with me this morning, I could feel the guy's projection and it felt, instead of me going into it and feeling comfortable with it, it felt quite uncomfortable. Wrong. Yeah. It felt wrong, didn't it? But then we often avoid um, what's happening. My question on that is, is then can, in a relationship, can we be confused with that attraction of the addictions that I found my soulmate? Exactly. You're exactly right. This is exactly what is happening for most people who feel that found their soulmate. Is that all that's really happening is this person matches the majority of their addictions. Does that make sense? And, and if you can think of it, and it, if you can think of it and just picture it in your mind as a big thing of energy coming out of you, like looking for a hook. Do you know what I mean? And, and the more unhealed emotions we have in ourselves, look, one of these is... Um, the more unhealed emotions we have in ourselves, the more hooks we've got going out, right, to everyone. And you imagine in a relationship, if one person, you find one person that looks after the majority of those hooks, you've found your ideal partner. Right? And you can say, oh, he's my soulmate. Oh, he's so beautiful. You know, he just, he just makes me feel good on every level, right? But in reality, he may not be your soulmate at all and be just looking after every one or the majority of your intergender emotional injuries. Can you all understand why, for the last 18 months, I've been incredibly triggered? Because <laughs> there was no hooks <laughs> getting satisfied. So a question on the spiritual hooks. Um, often you can go to um, theta healers yep. and they'll remove spiritual hooks. You'll identify them and have them removed. Yep. That, is that superficial? And Very not, superficial. And not lasting? Not lasting. And it, you, you try it in your relationship, it doesn't last. Because what's happening is that majority of time we want to have them. We're, and we're not addressing that issue that we want to have them. So, so we, we go along to a healer, you know, lay down, do some theatre healing on us, they remove a few hooks and they might also remove some hooks from some spirits as well in the process, right? But the truth is inside of my soul, I want that hook. I want that person to give me that emotion. I want them to make me feel good. And so what am I doing? I'm just going to re-establish a whole other group of hooks. And this is why none of, nothing really works unless we do it at the soul level, until we do it at the emotional level. I've, I've got a, uh, an awful relationship with my um, sister-in-law, an awful relationship with my um, daughter-in-law, uh -huh. to the point where uh, neither of them can really stand me for any time at all. Yep. And but I, I don't seem to um, have that um, awful um, reaction coming from other women. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, is there an addiction there or is it incompatibility mm -hmm. or what is it? Because they, they can't stand me and I, I don't actually know why. Yeah, so what Peter's saying here, he's got himself, right? He's got two women in particular who are close by him. One's his sister-in-law and another one is a daughter-in-law, both, both by him, who seem to just react to him negatively all the time. All right? So it's his law of attraction, agreed? What's going on is that the reason why they are reacting to you is that you don't satisfy their hooks. 
right? And in fact, you not only don't satisfy their hooks, there's some emotional injuries in you that are the, ac at the exact opposite of their hooks. I, right? I can feel that because they, they, they are like um, overtly, aggressively unfriendly. Yes. Yeah, so, so they're proving to you they don't like you. Right? I've, got, I've got that message, but I don't know how to fix it. Okay, I well, the, the reason is, is because there is an emotional projection coming from you to all women, right? Okay. And the emotional projection going from you to all women is related to your mother. And the emotional projection coming from yourself to all women is, I want you to think that I'm a nice fella. I want you to think that I'm... You know, I want you to do that. And if you don't do it, if, if a woman doesn't do it, you don't take much notice of that particular woman. But why would they be so unfriendly? Because they, they have an emotion where they've got to be the special woman in, in any man's life. They've got to be the woman who's looked up to and, and, and cajoled to and all that. And you but don't do that. They've got a partner. I mean, I'm just... I know, but that's their emotional injury. It's not related to just their partner. It's related to their childhood, just like your emotional injury is related, you see. Okay. Yep. So, so the key is for you to look at the projection that you've got going to all women. And the type of women that you... And I've seen you change even in your relationship with Mary, for example. When Mary had her pleasing man, pleasing man thing going on, you and Mary got along fine. Once Mary started detuning from a pleasing man, with the pleasing man think you feel quite challenged by Mary, right? And that's because your hook is, I want the woman to love me. The woman has to love me. The woman ha and you can see this is related to your childhood and your teenage life, where you never felt connected or loved by women at all. And there's some core emotion there that needs to be looked at for yourself. So what's happening is these two women in particular have exactly the opposite injury, right? They want to be the one who's feeling special, not you, them. They want you to make them feel special. And you're not making them feel special because your hook is I want them to make me feel special. Does that make sense? And so there's a real big like clash of hooks going on. And, and when that happens, one or both parties, and in their case, you know, you're not given to anger so much, so in their case they are, so their emotional reaction is like one of explosion whenever they even think of about you. Right. Right? So, you know, let, it, let alone be in your company, you know. So when they're in your company, of course, the first thing they want to do is put you down and hammer you into submission so that you give them the nice special emotion. But every time that happens, you then go to say, I'm not feeling special, I'm not and you feel more rejection of them. You see, it actually exacerbates the situation because of the two. Now the key is, to what you've been doing up to, you know, recently, is you've thought, oh, there's something wrong with these women. <laughs> you know what I mean? But the I, truth I still is, think that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the truth is, they have an emotional injury of hooks going out to all men. And if you look at it, your brother and your son please that hook that they have, and you don't. And that's why they don't like you very much. Does that make sense? And whenever your brother or your son, or your son is in your company, your brother and your son don't please their hook as much either. Right? And it's the, worse when they're around. Exactly. Yeah. So what will happen then is these women get even more upset with the fact, and they see it as your fault that you're, you know, they're not receiving these emotions now from their, from their husbands. And so there's even more anger and more resentment inside of them. It's due to the fact that you have an addiction going towards the women, and this addiction is totally the opposite of what these women want from a man. Mm -hmm. Because when my brother and I were growing up, we had a really close relationship. We did everything together. Yep. As soon as he met his uh, now wife, yep. the relationship just went downhill rapidly yep. to the point now where we've got a, a lousy relationship yep. uh, and even worse with the, with the um, daughter and the Well, you look at what you do with your son. It's the same. Your son is close to you. You know, you do things together, you spend a lot of your life together and have done in the past, right? Mm -hmm. And so what's she seeing? What's she feeling? There's massive jealousy. Exactly, exactly. And, and it's because of the hooks. They are very incompatible. So instead of looking at her hooks, what you need to do is look at your own. What causes this? See, if you heal this emotion, 
these women will now just starting tr start treating you like any other man. Really? So instead of yelling at you and getting angry at you, they will probably treat you in a bit more calmer way. They still will have their hooks going out, but because you don't have exactly the opposite hook, there won't be as much flashing going on. Does that make sense? So you can definitely change it just by dealing with your own hook, even if the other person doesn't want to deal with anything at all. So what, what, what would I feel? What, what would I... Like if I start, if I start thinking about yep. the unpleasant relationship, yep. um, I, I can feel, I can feel sad about that. I can feel um, a regret that those two women who I'd like to have a good relationship with don't want to know me. Yeah. Um, but You're not being honest with yourself. You don't want a good relationship with these two women, Peter. I just don't want a bad one. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, a, want, I, don't, I don't want her to be my best friend, but I just don't want her to project massive amounts of, of The truth is you're not interested in any woman who doesn't make you feel special. That's the truth. No. And if you, you need to actually start owning that inside of yourself. If a woman doesn't make you feel special, you now treat her in a neutral way. Right? She's not treated as favourable or unfavourable, she's just neutral now to you. But if the woman makes you feel special, they're a good woman to you. That's how you feel. It's your projection. So is that unloving? Yes. Definitely. Most definitely unloving. To treat the person in a neutral way is unloving. Yes. I don't treat you neutrally ever, do I? No, no. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yes. Why would you treat anyone in a neutral way? You're all brothers and sisters. Like, wouldn't there be a deep feeling of love coming from you to any person? I'm not at the point where I can feel a deep love. Um, for every now you're person. getting into excuses, and we don't allow excuses here, you know? <laughs> honestly, honestly what, what's happening is like any, to you, this is, this is your hook, and this is going to sound really bad, and to be frank with you, it is, right? But it's not a judgment, right? This, it, it would sound bad. You learnt from a very young age that there's only two types of women. There's a kind of woman who will make you feel good about yourself and there's a the kind of woman who doesn't. And maybe three type of women. There's a third type and that is the kind of woman who makes you feel bad about yourself. Right? So you've got bad, good, neutral. Basically that's it. You see every woman on this, in this, from an emotional perspective, you see every woman like this. Every woman in this audience fits into one of those three categories for you. That's all. That's their only importance to you at this point. That's the thing that's going to feel bad. Their only importance to you is how they make you feel. That's their only importance to you at this point. And it's because of an unhealed emotion relating to your mum. That's the way it is. So, so naturally, any woman you go up to, she's making you feel good. I like her. We do things for her. She's lovely because she's making me feel good. Anyone's neutral? Oh, yeah, yeah I can take her or leave her, right? Anyone who makes me feel bad? Oh, oh, oh. You know, how can I fix this? I want to fix this so that she's back to making me feel good. That's what's going on inside. So you're not actually seeing the person as an individual at all, really. What you're seeing is what emotion they're giving you. And this is, and by the way, what I'm saying to Peter applies to all of our emotional hooks. You're not seeing the person. You're not seeing the individual, their good qualities, their, you know, their personality, all of their traits or anything when you're doing this. You're not seeing any of those things. All you're seeing is a person like an antenna with either good emotions for you or bad emotions for you. We're looking at it all so selfishly and we don't even realise it. We're just focused on what's going on and how they make me feel. Right? Now the key to do that first, to getting to the emotion, is to acknowledge the truth of that. And if you don't acknowledge the truth of that, and I've had to acknowledge the truth of like hundreds of these types of truths, so, so if you don't acknowledge the truth of it, you will never get to the emotion, ever. Because you don't believe the, tr the truth of it, and remember, without truth, emotion cannot flow through you. It cannot. So, so I need to say, ah, oh, I'm not even seeing these women as women. I'm not even really wanting to know each woman as a different person. I don't really care too much for them, aside from the fact that they're angry with me. That's the only thing I'm really caring about at this point. That's the emotional hook from the childhood. 
And that comes from a deep feeling of not being loved and cared for from your mother that you need to allow yourself to actually work your way through. And the mum, your mum had some really negative attitudes towards men, Pete. Really negative attitudes towards men. Because of her abuse, she was, t she was abused as a child, abused as an adult woman, and so she just had this huge protection on any of her sons. Your brother, yourself, have this emotional injury. Now, of looking at a woman as only someone to please in order to get an emotion back in return. Does that make sense? Now, the key is to own the emotional hook inside of you. Not avoid it inside of you. Don't, don't focus on the other person. What can I do to do, fix this with the other person? What will fix it is what you fix inside of you. So what you, when you address this hook you have going to women where you're not actually seeing the woman, you're just seeing them as an emotional, like a, they're, they're like a, really you could call them a, an object. You're not necessarily seeing them as a sexual object, just as an object that either gives you a nice feeling or doesn't give you a nice feeling. And if you think about all of our interactions with all of our, with our relationships, a lot of the times we're not seeing the person, we're actually seeing the person through our emotional filters, which is very different to what the person really is in most cases. Does that make sense? And that's important to see. So, you, so the key, your question was, how do I deal with this emotionally? You need to firstly face the truth that you're not seeing women as individuals. You are seeing them as objects that can give you either a nice feeling, a neutral feeling, or a bad feeling. Secondly, you are not allowing yourself to connect to the child, these are the truths, you're not allowing yourself to connect to the childhood reason why you see a woman as an object like that, which is that your mother never ever was treated by, as anything other than an object by her father, by, by your father, your father, and also by her own father. Uh, she was abused by her own father. And so she you know, was treated like an object in front of you all of your life, basically. And then on top of that, she never, because of her anger and rage, never gave you loving emotions. Right? And so, so now, a lot of your goal is to only get the loving emotions. Like It's a missing part, so you need to grieve that. And when you allow yourself to focus on the truth of that and really feel about it in your heart, you'll start connecting to some of that grief. And the mechanism by which you can do it is the law of attraction with these women. So instead of going down the track of saying, of saying oh, what can I do to fix my relationship with my sister-in-law? What you need to do is, how do I feel about how my sister-in-law feels about me? And go into the grief of that. And what that will do is take you down into the stuff with your mum. Does that make sense? If Thank, you allow thanks that very much, AJ. Yep. Good. Um, just go. I was being super efficient, Mike Girling. Um, You're efficient, Peter, Mike. Peter, I'd just like to share something as a woman that I've done. It might just help. I was with a partner and I had some bad news that somebody had cancer and it made me feel really sad. And I said to him in the time, we were in the car going home, I said, all I want to do is go home, you make love to me and make me feel better. That's what I was saying. He turned around and he said to me, I'm not making love to a woman just because she needs it. At the time, I thought that he was absolutely awful. And when I say awful, I thought, how could someone not just put their arm around me and hug me? Anyway, we went home, he, he flatly stated that's how he felt, and I had to accept that. It was really, really funny. Going around in the car the next day, this big light switched on, and I thought, I know what I wanted to do. I wanted him to be my father, put his arm around me and say, it's okay, darling, I'll make it all right for you. Yeah. And the minute I did that, I realised what I did to men, that I wanted them to make me feel better because I couldn't make myself feel better if something happened. That's it. And you know, once you feel it, you sudden, this lovely light goes on, but it's, it, it, you start realising it, it, you look around and realise what you do. Yeah. Because up to that point, I didn't know I did it. Yeah. Now there's further you need to go with this. You can feel that emotion still there, so this is still unhealed. So the key is to, to what you just described, to even go further into that emotion because you'll feel some pretty strong grief that's still locked up inside of you about it. Yep. You can feel it rising there. So, um, 
Who we go next? Who hasn't had a turn? Um, we go over there. So if we go over there. Um, when my partner comes to me um, with a pleasing energy, yeah. wants to please me, or uh, my whole body just goes back. Yeah. I go. How is it? Backwards. It feels like a barrage almost. Yeah, it feels like I don't want it. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I have that quite fatigue coming both from the pleasing uh, past and my body just, I don't even want to be touched. Yeah. Even when he wants to make love to me, it doesn't come from a true place. Yeah. My body just, and I, I'm very honest in it. Yeah. Because um, I feel I'm pretty honest in my relationship. Yeah. I, I need to say to him, look, don't Not touch now, me. not no, now. No, it's just... It's not right. It's not right. Yeah. And sometimes I also feel... Uh, he, I, I don't feel him as, as a man making me feel happy. Yeah. This is not the case in that relationship. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm wondering, is this my soulmate? Uh, you know, is he really the man? Yeah. And when I look deep inside of me, know that he's not there for to make me happy. Either. Exactly. Yeah. And um, because he's also very different, we come from completely different past. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of frictions on the way, yeah. constantly. So, yeah. And then I meet you and you talk about soulmate. And and we keep but, on but see, don't, yeah. don't misinterpret soulmates because, yeah. because soulmates is like, a lot of times we think a soulmate is the one who's going to yeah, actually, like everything's going to be perfect yeah, with my I soulmate. Don't, no, no, I don't have that. And that actually is totally incorrect. It's not right yes, and I know this. Totally incorrect. Because I know it, yeah. Now, I'm not saying that mm -hmm. down the track it won't be perfect with yeah, your soulmate, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. What I'm saying is, is that we we attract people who, with all the it's the hooks that finish up attracting yeah, a lot of things, yeah, yeah. and that's what we need that. to be aware of. Yeah. 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 And it's good that you actually can feel when it's not coming from a pure place. I really, I'm very And sensitive. don't enter the transaction. Yeah, I, can, mm. I don't. Yeah, um, joy, and then. I'm very honest in that. That's I, good. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. I can't any different. I can't be any different. Yeah. I never could be. That's good. So, yeah. yeah. AJ, um, Peter's friends up there, we all have people like that in our lives and, and they're really, I see them as our spiritual gifts because they're the people in our lives who are always going to press our buttons and um, make us realise, oh, the law of attraction is alive and well and um, I must be projecting something that I need to work on. Yep, but and you're not being honest, Joy. Aren't I? No. Oh, well, okay. It's a little reframe there. It's a little reframing little, that went on there. Oh, that's a little reframe. Yep. <laughs> you call them spiritual gifts, right? Yes. The truth is, the reason why you call them that is that is true. They are your spiritual gifts. Yes. But it's not how you actually are feeling at the moment you get triggered. And if anyone is honest with themselves emotionally, none of us at the moment someone's yelling at you feel like, oh, this is my spiritual gift, right? <laughs> We feel whatever the emotion is that the person yelling at us is triggering within us. And that's what we have to own in that moment. So just be careful about, uh, even if it's true, the truth is they are spiritual gifts, but, but reframing it actually prevents you from feeling the emotion. I told you I was an expert at that one. I know, you did yesterday, you said that. So, yeah, and I'll take, take it up to Jim. Thanks. Following on from yesterday, with my question about sex, yeah. I got to the realisation that I'm um, profoundly fearful of intimacy. That the addiction that I've got is wanting Graham to be that ab abusive. I have this thing with Graham where he, no matter what I do, he's not abusive and when I first met him I realized he was a very safe person so at that stage I didn't know what it was in him yep. that made him feel safe for me yep as I've gotten to know his stuff 
his stuff matches perfectly. But the confusion that, following on from yesterday, mm -hmm. the confusion that I have is why he doesn't react to me or respond to me in a sexual way in the way that I'd attracted other guys in the past. It's because of the demand coming from you, the addiction coming from you, is also through the abuse that you've received. And so, so when you have sexual feelings, there's this feeling going on inside of you that says, that says oh, if I've got sexual feelings, they need to be satisfied in, a, in an abusive way, right? Now, he's feeling that coming from you, and he's not the kind of abusive man who can do that. So instead of feeling like, you know, that it's a loving transaction when you want to make love, he feels like, no, this is a, if I enter this, this is going to be an abusive transaction for myself and for you. So he's feeling totally different than what you're feeling in that particular moment. And the, the other thing is, because once you release the emotion inside of you of this connection between sex and abuse and, and reconnect sex with love, what will actually happen is instead of him feeling an emotion coming from you of, a, a sort of wanting to be a, a sort of a, like abusive sex, if you like, what he will feel is more of a loving emotion coming from you towards him, and it won't be demand, it won't be a demand on him. It'll be a, it'll be a feeling for him rather than a demand on him. And when he feels that, I'm pretty sure you'll find his response will be very different than what it currently is. Now, there's times in your relationship where this has happened. Right? If you think back over the, you know, the last you know, few months, months we've been together, there's times that it's happened and you've been a bit confused as to why it happened in that particular moment. Right? The key for you is to go back to those moments that it has happened, there's been a few occasions, and actually allow yourself to feel what you really felt in that moment for a Graham, and you'll see that actually what you were feeling was a very non-demanding love for him rather than a feeling that he's got to touch you, he's got to, to make you feel good. And following on from that, the fear of intimacy I have when our relationship starts to grow, the addiction kicks, kicks in of sabotage. Yes, yes. But it manifests in my physical body yep. in that um, I become menstrual yep. uncontrollably and yep. it, pushes, it, it pushes me away for sometimes weeks on end yes. to, cut, to cut the intimacy and the addiction is, is the, f the fear is so painful, it's so frightening to be loved yeah. because the loving feeling's been linked with so much pain in the past yep. and, s and so much abuse. hurt and abuse mm -hmm. that my whole, my whole nature keeps wanting Graham to fall, fall into that category. Mm -hmm. to become that type of man. Mm -hmm. But he never was. No. Right from the beginning he never was. He never can be because no. he doesn't have that in him. That's right. And so I'm, I, I got to last night in the processing the, this deep realisation of just how frightened I am still. Yep. And you're so frightened, in fact, of men still that your whole body reacts in a, in a way, like you become menstrual as a, as a result of that fear. You scare the death out of me. You really do. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, no. Don't, why do you say sorry? This well, because is I don't want to scare the death out of you. If I don't say it out loud, then for me, I, that's the beginning of admitting. Yeah, you've got to say the truth of how you feel in every case. No. Definitely. I'm, I'm still very frightened of men and frightened. Yes, I feel unlovable, but I'm more frightened of being loved. Yeah. I'm re more frightened of Yeah, that. yep. She, she says she's frightened of me too. Yeah, that's right. And, and the reason why is because you're not fitting into the mould of the normal man, do you know what I mean, in your own experience. He's nothing like the mould. Exactly. He, he, this is a... I've never met anybody He's broken like, the mould. <laughs> <laughs> you know... God's working in my life. Yeah. So he, he has a lot more sincere and, and, and love with integrity for you than what any other man you've ever had in your history has had for you, including your father, right? 
and this has been the case for you in this relationship and this is why the key is to go into these deeper emotions which you're now visiting rather than actually blaming Graham for he's not reacting the way you're hoping he will react. Because he's a very sensitive man and he's going to feel whenever he's getting a projection from you that's unloving and he's going to reflect that back at you. So the key for you is to allow that now to actually enter you and, and allow that to realise that, oh, I've got a demand on him that's unloving. That's my hook. I'm putting out this hook and Graham's not responding and it hurts me. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. I feel that as, as a gay man that uh, my projections are more towards men rather than towards women. Yep. And I, as you said to uh, Peter, that, that, uh, that uh, I, I see men as good, bad or neutral. Yes. And that I got this more from my father than I did from my mother. Yes. That being said though, Ian, there is some issues with women in all of this uh, interaction too, obviously. Yeah. Uh, because, because what's happening for yourself is there's some deep emotional injuries with mum and you expect women to be a certain type of person in order for you to get along with them. And so have a look at that as well. For any person, it doesn't matter what your sexuality is, for any person generally we have intergender issues that relate to both parents, not just one parent. But there will be a parent generally that we side with in terms of emotionally side with. So if that's my mother and my mother was abused by my father, then I'll be angry at all men who abuse women. Does that make sense? And I'll be conciliatory to all women who have been abused. If, if I'm a man and I side with my father who abused my mother, then I usually become a man who finishes up abusing women as a result. So what I'm giving you is an illustration that for every single person, it doesn't matter the, the, the sexual orientation of any person, every single person has intergender emotional injuries that they need to look at because every one of those come out as a hook into other, into other things, into, into everyone, every, to people. I, I seem to get upset with the focus on women yep. and, uh, and fathers seem to be left out of it a bit. But yep. so, so that, that's where I was coming so from. So let's, let's look at that feeling you have. You're upset with a focus on women and not on men. Mm. And if you think about it, that's one of your own injuries towards yourself isn't it? You feel that men keep getting put down, keep getting reduced down inside and this is what's happened in your own life of course through your law of attraction as well. That's there as well as an emotion. So the key, the key is allow yourself to feel that emotion. Yeah. yeah. The truth is I love men as much as I love women. Hey Jake, can I, can I just ask something about that? Um, one of the things that happened um, since the time that I was up front with you at Udlo and dealing with all the gay stuff um, what I also seem to have discovered it, is that um, I had to deal with homophobia from both from both genders. Yep. And I just wondered if that's a general thing or whether that's just specific to gay people. Yep. Um, almost every gay person has had projections from both genders of homophobia, and so it's and spirits as well. And spirits as well. Yes. Mm. Yes. Um, Almost every person on the planet who has ever been gay has had both sexes projecting at them negatively, not just one gender. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's ringing a bit. If we can just turn down. It's, uh, right. Sorry, babe, you haven't said anything over that. Sorry about that. I didn't let it's you get okay. a word edge, edgeways in. Now, we were sort of project. we were going through the first addiction. <laughs> well, I saw it. What if, yep. what if um, I read that and then you read that and, you know, we do it back and forth? Yeah, yeah, that's good. a good idea. Yeah. So what we're going to do now is we're going to act out, if you like, these interplays between, and here we're assuming a you know, female-male type relationship, but if it's a male-male relationship, there'll still be these interplays going on. If there's a female-female relationship, there's still going to be these interplays going on between each gender, right? to, to, to each partner I mean, reflected on the injuries based on what's happened in our childhood. So what we're going to do is I'm going to be the partner Mary's for, for Mary and we're going to work through what our beliefs are and so forth. So if my core belief is I'm never safe, so this is how we could have a perfect relationship. 
Yeah. So if I'm a woman and I feel I'm never safe and love will make me feel safe. So my core belief will be to give love means to give safety. In other words, I, if I provide financial and physical safety to the woman, that's me giving love. So my addiction in this case is if my partner loves me, my partner will always make me feel safe and secure. And my addiction is when I make my partner feel secure, I'm a worthwhile, strong, masculine person. So my projection at this man is if my partner wants my love, I have to firstly feel they'll make me feel safe. And my projection at her is my partner needs my protection and care. She needs me. It's going along swimmingly. We're at the fourth date. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so my action is when I feel safe and secure, I'm affectionate and sexual with my partner. And I feel like I will always protect my partner from any harm, sexual, physical or financial. So any man who comes along and projects at her, I'll get in his face and say, what are you doing, like, you know, projecting on my girl? And, you know, and, and then if uh, she's saying, oh, she needs some money, no worries, here's some money for you, that's no worries, you know, and I'll keep on doing these things, that's my action. We're going to have a lovely relationship. We're going to be soulmates. <laughs> Until? Until I have a financial failure. And then I get angry, resentful, insistent, very demanding, and I might search for security from my parents or from elsewhere. And I might project sexually at Brian if I feel he might make me safe and be financially secure. <laughs> Does that make sense? So that's if that's what would make so obviously at that point now our relationship's breaking down, right? We've now got some issues. Now what would we do what would we do if we were in harmony with divine love? That's the good question that we need to ask. So I still have the financial failure. So let's say I haven't worked through my emotional injury of why I'm rejecting money in my life and I have a financial meltdown. So I still have the same financial meltdown that I had in the previous example. But if I was owning my emotions, I might feel the fact that, oh my gosh, now my partner has no money, I'm terrified, I'm not safe, um, and all of my emotions from childhood where I felt um, financially unsafe <laughs> and physically unsafe, I would begin to process those. I would also uh, pray to God to help with those issues and I wouldn't run off to mummy and daddy um, to try and get them to fix it and I wouldn't project sexually at Brian or anyone else because I would be deep in the feeling of I'm not safe. Now because she's in deep in the feeling, I have, my partner's now deep in this feeling of feeling unsafe, I'm going to feel like I'm responsible for her feeling crying feeling unsafe, going through terror and all these other things. now. Because you're failing in your job. I've, I've failed in my job and now I feel like I'm starting to fail in terms of what's my role? My role is to make her feel safe and now I've failed in my role as well. So what would I have to do? I would have to now go through these emotions of why do I have all these connections with making the woman feel safe and secure financially and giving her things financially, is that, is that really love and I'd have to work through all those emotions. Essentially why your, why your sense of self-worth is linked to a woman and making her feel safe. Yeah, exactly. Does that make sense? Can you see that one is acting out emotional hooks like the first bit, the idyllic, the idyllic part of the relationship and this is why Many relationships go through these patterns. You meet the person. It feels fantastic, right? You have great sex and everything goes on for a while. You get together and you might even, you know, have, it might go on for long enough for you to have a relationship. And then all these niggling things start occurring, right? All these emotional, the other injuries that are not compatible. You start noticing them, right? And when you start noticing them, then you start drawing away from each other rather than dealing with those injuries. You start blaming the other person for what they're triggering in you or she blames you for what you're triggering in her. Does that make sense? That's the pattern of most relationships and we eventually draw away, away, away. Or we stay together because we're both nicely looking after each person's injuries. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> and, uh, and the problem with that 
is that we're never going to be at one with God if we do that. And yeah. it's also not authentic what's happening between us. Mm. Yeah. It's not true, is it? Like, if I'm just, if I'm responding to this hook into Mary and Mary's responding to these hooks with me, are we really having a truthful relationship based on our true personalities and our true qualities and our true selves? No, we're not. We're just straight in this addiction process. Because in truth, I'm someone who's very afraid. And I'm not saying any of that to my partner. I'm just feeling great about him because he's helping me avoid that emotion. Yeah. Does that make sense? We're not even being real. All right, let's look at the next one. Yep. Um, oh, oh. There's a really good movie called, um, it's an old movie called When a Man Loves a Woman. Yep. And it's a really good, um, it is good depiction of that. I think yeah. we recommended it on the last um, handout. On the last relationship handout. On the last handout. relationships. Yeah. yeah, it is a very good movie. It's about um, a relationship where the woman's an alcoholic and the man sort of wants her to be an alcoholic because of all the things he gets from her when she's under the influence. And it's a very, very good movie of uh, codependency in a relationship. Yeah. When a man, man loves a woman. woman. Yeah. Uh, it's got Andy uh, Garcia and Meg, Michelle. Oh, Meg, Meg Ryan. Ryan in it. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay, do you want to be the partner? Shall I be the partner? I'll be the first person this time. Okay. All right. My core belief is that love means I'll always be listened to. And the reason why I have this belief is that my mother never listened to me or my mother always listened to me even when I was wrong. So you, you get it like, some, I know this is a, a bit of a, we hear a lot of the Italian mamas, right? What they do is they care for their son so much and they're taught to do this through, their, through the environment, they care for their son so much that he can do no wrong. Right? So I might have grown up in that way, thinking that I can do no wrong, nothing I ever do is wrong, and so I might have grown up in that environment. And I might have grown up with um, a dad who was uh, really sad or lonely, and the only way I felt like I could get love from him is to listen to everything that he said. So my core belief becomes, in order to get love, I have to listen to the other person. All right. So we're going to now, I'm going to have an addiction. Other people, including my partner, must always listen to me. And mine is my addiction. I feel I must listen or pretend to listen <laughs> and caretake my partner if I want to receive their love. So my projection at my partner, so this is the emotional thing, the hook now that's coming out from, my part, in, from myself to my partner, is... They must, you must listen to me if you want anything from me. And my projection is, no matter what you do to me, I'll always listen to you. Aren't we getting along swimmingly? <laughs> of course we will. So, so my action is I talk and I talk and I talk and I talk and my partner hardly gets a word in generally edgewise and, and I say what we're doing and I plan everything and, and all of that happens and my partner gets to hardly have any of the role in any of those things. And, and um, I'm totally okay with that as long as he thinks I'm wonderful in the process. Okay. And we're getting along fine. We're getting along fine. We feel like it's a good relationship. We've happy got a marriage. Happy marriage. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now what happens? Okay. For some reason... I stop listening to you. So something gets triggered in uh, Mary where she feels like, for example, that you know I've done something wrong, maybe even. Whoa, like well, you... I'm, I'm your, normally perfect, right? And now I'm doing something wrong. So, so she's not listened to me anymore. And my response is, I get angry with her, resentful of her, insistent with her, very demanding. I tell her if she's not going to listen to me, I'm going to go off and get another woman who does. And I get really, really upset. Uh, now we've got our relationship sort of in a meltdown. Now, by the way, the relationship wasn't really a relationship in the first place, was it? Because we were just nursing each other's addictions, really, in the end. Okay, so what would we do on the divine love path? So, so for some reason, I don't listen to you. Okay, so I feel the childhood emotions of how much 
I want to be listened to and how much I feel unloved when I'm not listened to and how much I think I'm right with everything and I go into the deep emotions of that and, in, and, I, and I actually have to, I will have to work through many, many issues of repentance and asking Mary for forgiveness of treating her in this manner of actually demanding or insisting that she always does my beckon. That's what I will do. Now to do that it's going to require a lot of humility in me, isn't it? I'm going to have to be very humble to actually acknowledge that, that I was wrong. And that's where I'll have a lot of trouble if I, you know, obviously the relationship won't survive if I can't acknowledge that. And in the meantime, my deep addiction, which is obviously very, uh, a very deep injury, that I'll, I'll take anything from the man as long as he projects at me that I'm wonderful, would be exposed. So I would have to look at why I have a desperate need for a man to think that I'm wonderful. Yeah. Can you see, if both of us own our own emotion rather than projecting it at the other, we're now in harmony with love with it for each other. All right. Okay. This one, I think you have to be the. I have to be the core person. belief. Yeah, because we've done it as a man and a woman, haven't we? Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is a good one. Yep. <laughs> so, as a woman, I feel sex is dirty and shameful, but I have to do it for men, or I have to do it with men. And I have a really unique injury in this case. I have this injury of the, what you would call the Madonna complex, I suppose, and that is that. The woman that I love, who's my wife, shouldn't be a shameful, sex sexy hussy, right? She's got to be almost like asexual. Do you follow me? She's got to be almost like pure. She's got to be pure. She's got to be pure, beautiful, and I can worship her. Huh? That's my emotion. So my addiction becomes to avoid se I, that I avoid sex and my own body as much as possible. And my addiction is. My wife's a good woman and not dirty, right? And so I'm just addicted to that concept that she's a good woman and not dirty. And if she is ever sexual with me, she's dirty. So, so far we're getting along really well because I don't want sex and he doesn't want me to have it. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I may be going off and having uh, a prostitute here and an affair there because those women are dirty, but I won't have my intimate relationship with my wife because I'm in this worshipful state of her. Huh? So my projection at my husband is if you really love me you will not project sexually at me or expect sex very often. And my projection is I won't, don't want sex from my partner. I, want, I have it from, with other people. I do the sexual projection thing with others but not my partner. And so the, my action is that I avoid sex, but when I have sex, I'm not present. I grin and bear it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And my action is I cheat on my partner quite regularly with women who are allowed to be sexual with me. Right. Now, you know, we're going to have a marriage. And you know that that marriage might last 15, 20 years like that. Yeah. I, I think it happens. It happens very regularly. But then what happens, see, because I don't like my body and I avoid it and I avoid sex, I'm quite overweight because that's a good way of getting rid of any sexual projection from any man. Or that was so I think. Um, that's what my mother taught me. So my action is I actually, I lose weight. I change in the partnership. I lose weight and I begin to feel all these feelings of sexual shame that I got from my parents. I'm releasing them. I'm feeling more connected with my body. I actually think, wow, I might be a bit desirable and I want to have sex with my husband. Right. And what is my reaction? Like, you can't have a dirty and shameful desire for me. Like, like how dare you? And what are you doing losing weight? Like, like you're just making yourself look like like a hussy now, you know. I want her to put on weight, so I start feeding her. I start feeding her. I, I bring home takeout now that I never did before. Sabotaging my diet. Like sabotaging her diet and everything, because I want her bigger. I don't want her attractive for other men. She's pure, like she's my pure woman. Does that make sense? Like that's my my reaction. So I might even get angry with her for losing weight because of that.
How many of you ladies have had your partner get angry with you for losing weight? Hmm, there's a few. Yeah. It's an interesting thing. Yeah. yeah. If we're on the divine love path, which could be the case in this partnership, because I've taken some action to release some of my causal emotion, which has changed how I feel about myself, and if my partner was on the divine love path, what would he do? Well, um, I'm going to decide I don't want to be on the divine love path. Sorry. Actually. Oops. I, 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 just, I just want you to gain weight. You're, like, I, I'm going to feed you, right, more than I ever have before. And I'm going to make sure that every time you look a bit slimmer, uh, that I get angry with you. And, uh, you know, I just say, now, now you're looking like a slut, actually. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I want to be with a woman who looks like that. So that would trigger a lot more of my sexual shame that I would process. Mm -hmm. And then I would, be able, I would reach a point where I'd be able to point out to my partner his error-based emotions. I wouldn't respond to his projection at me to gain weight. And if he continued in the same way, I would actually leave the relationship. Mind you, she might have left a lot earlier, given how many times I've cheated on her, right? But that gives you an example of what might happen. Right. This one's a, a man-woman thing again. So we'll okay. So I'm the woman. Yep. And my core belief is men will only make me feel safe if they have sexual feelings for me. So, how many, so of, I'm, yeah. how many of you ladies have had in the past or have now a belief that if a man doesn't want to have sex with you, then you're not safe with this man? Like, if, yeah, see, there's a lot, there's a a lot, lot of more. you are not recognising you actually have this emotion. And this it might not be that you want to go to bed with them, but you just feel a lot better if you know that they might think you're quite attractive. Let's change it to attractive to them. How many of you have the emotion that if a man feels attracted to you, you're now safe with him? You now have control of I, him. I had this one. Okay. Now, all I did was reword it into sex because you're actually projecting sexually, unbeknown, right? But anyway, let's go for that. My feeling is I'm unattractive. And... My addiction is because of this feeling that I'm only safe when men project sexually at me or, or find me attractive, that I have to give sexual feelings to men. And my addiction is I want women to make me feel attractive. So my projection is all men must find me sexy and alluring. And my projection is all women have got to find me attractive. It's working pretty well so far. Right. So she's making me feel attractive and I'm feeling good. So the relationship that evolves, or my action, is that I'm very, I'm overtly sexual in our relationship, but also I'll probably be quite flirtatious with other men, because I still want to feel safe. So she projects sexually at other men, um, and what, let's, let's call it, she projects the need to feel special with other men, not just her partner. So that's a sexual projection, ladies. Like, Remember, I've been saying, yes, I have sexually projected at other men. I've said it lots of times. So we're not talking this about the desire for sex from, with them. We're talking about a projection to feel safe, secure, special, whatever. They are attractive. They are all sexual projections that you're projecting out of you. There's a hook coming out of you. It's a sexual hook. It's related to the opposite gender and it's sexual in nature. Does that make sense? Okay. And my feeling is... I'm sexually attracted to this beautiful woman who shares her sexual energy so freely and openly. Isn't it lovely? Mm -hmm. uh. Okay, in this case you're going to change. Yeah, now what happens with me is that I go through this process of, uh, of you know, I, I find, you know, I finish up talking to AJ of all people, right? And man, he just blows me for six and, and says, like, you've got no self-worth. What are you doing with this woman treating you like this or whatever? He might not have said those things. But what happens is that I realise that I feel so unattractive to the opposite gender. I have this realisation. And so I start working through the feelings of the core beliefs underneath as to why I feel so unattractive to, other, to, to women. And I start crying. 
my relationship with my mother and you know how she never treated me like I was any, of any value whatsoever as a male. She always put me down and treated me badly and my brothers and sisters got treated better than I did from my mother and so in the end I had this feeling inside of myself that just I'm um, unworthy as a male and so I do start dealing with that and and so what happens now is I start feeling hurt when Mary sexually projects at other men. Does that make sense? I start feeling the feelings of hurt because those feelings are higher now than the feelings I was getting from her, that I'm attractive, because I don't need those feelings anymore. I'm starting to feel like I am attractive sexually and I'm starting to feel like, well, if I'm so attractive sexually, why are you still projecting to these other men looking for feelings of you know, being attractive and so forth? What, what's going on there? So I start complaining about that, I start talking to Mary about that, and I start actually exposing that emotion in her. So all of a sudden my partner who was really into me and I was really into him, he's less into me. So immediately I feel less safe and secure. So what might I do? Exactly. Start projecting even more sexual energy at other men around me because I, I, I don't want to feel this feeling of feeling very unsafe and insecure. But if we were on the divine love path, I would do what I just described and Mary instead would feel... Uh, I would recognise what AJ is saying to me and I would feel within myself the error-based um, flirtations that are going on and I would connect to feelings of repentance and sorrow for my sexual projections and begin to feel the underlying core belief, which is how sexually unsafe I feel and how fearful emotionally I feel around men. Yeah. And I'd stop sexually projecting and withdraw from men I'm sexually projecting at. Does that make sense? You would actually and get to the core emotion. If I can talk about my own experience a little bit, because I, I certainly had this um, uh, projection of wanting men to find me attractive. Um, for, for quite a while and when I stopped um, entering into those energetic exchanges I actually went through a phase of feeling and I probably still have this emotion feeling very unsafe around men there was nothing I could do to be in control in the situation and I felt very um, yeah like men are going to harm me which is a causal emotion for me obviously I don't think in my head that you're all going to harm me <laughs> but that's that's what was triggered for me so, so while, while there was a sexual projection occurring, Mary felt safe because she felt in control of what was going on in every inter-relationship, if you like, with every man. But as soon as she stops herself from doing that, the underlying core emotion, which is afraid of men, comes up. Does that make sense? I'm so afraid of men. And that just comes up because I now have stopped myself from giving the man what I need to control, give them to control them. And now they're not seeming very controlled around me and I'm going to feel quite frightened, which is my core emotion. The core emotion is, as a woman, I'm feeling quite frightened to actually feel that I don't have control of the man in every situation. Because to be frank with you, men physically generally are stronger than women. Okay? We are created in this way, right? And, and physical strength means nothing in a relationship, really, in the end. But historically what's happened is men have used their physical power and strength to dominate and harm women. So the subsequent result to that is most women have learnt to use their wiles, shall we call them that, their intellect and their emotions and their body in such a way that they can control the man from going too out of hand with them. Does that make sense? And so this is why it's a big multi-generational injury. It's because many women feel very fri frightened of men underneath and what they need to do, because they don't have the physical strength to control the man, they now need to use other techniques to actually get the man to, and, and keep the man under control so that they can avoid personal harm and abuse. Right. So it's a, it's a natural thing uh, to do, but of course if we're in harmony with love, not a very loving thing to do. No, and I've connected to some feelings of very deep shame about this whole exchange. 
felt very um, dirty, yeah. And for Mary, the core belief was that uh, was really a big, deep sadness about connecting to me, wasn't it? Connecting to one man. Because uh, our relationship within the first century was Mary had a very, very hard life in the first century up until the time of meeting me. She met me and had, a, in comparison, a much easier life. We were deeply in love with each other, obviously, and, and there was a really deep connection that we both had with each other. And then I died. So all of that loss just and then what happened many of my so-called followers who had actually treated Mary quite badly before I passed actually you know treated Mary even worse after I passed and as a result you know there was this, this terrible projections going at Mary, at Mary for lots of different reasons and that causes Mary now to not want to invest in one person anymore does that make sense? Now many of you ladies have this same issue where you don't want to invest in one person, put your all, all your eggs in one basket. By the way, many of you men have the same issue too, emotionally, of not wanting to put your, all your eggs in one basket. Because what happens if the person dies, if they get ill, if they cheat on you. pass away, cheat on you, you are going to be devastated. That's the feeling that you're avoiding, the devastation. And that is a multi-generational devastation feeling that's passed down through the different generations. Is that why a lot of girls and women these days feel they have to be independent so that they don't, and feel like they don't need a man or want a man? Very much so, yeah. Mary can comment about that because that's something that's we've talked about a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah almost aggressively independent in order to um, avoid that emotion also of not wanting to be vulnerable with my heart. Yeah. So they want a relationship but it has to be a relationship at a distance. Do you know what I mean? Like we have our own homes and we have our own lives and we get together occasionally. That kind of relationship. And my career and my car and my bank account. And yeah. And everything's kept separate. Yep. And by the way, many men have the same kind of emotion, but, but in this generation of women there's a very strong, very strong emotional injury. Isn't it true that um, are fathers raising their daughters that way these days? Well see, what's happening a lot in these days is that a lot of fathers are heavily invested in their daughters emotionally, right? And so what happens then, this creates a link between the father and the daughter that she never breaks. So, so a lot of these things that she would normally look for in a relationship, like security, safety, and all those different things, she doesn't need anymore because her father's already providing it, right? So she has a heavy emotional investment in her father and doesn't disconnect from him. So every man is just there so that she can have sex, basically, or a sexual relationship. That part's missing with her father, right? So she needs that satisfied from somewhere else. But she will still remain very connected with her father in every other aspect. And so you see a lot of women nowadays having stronger connections with their daddies, but actually never breaking those connections, like an umbilical cord between their daddy and themselves. And the daddies are doing it for emotional reasons as well. It's actually very damaging to the, to the lady's relationship with a partner. And it's something that a lot of younger women do need to work through. You can see how these emotional hooks can even be with our parents and, we can, and these emotional hooks can interfere with our relationship. So let's say if I had an emotional hook into my mother, right, and you see many men do have this as well, an emotional hook into their mothers. If I have an emotional hook into my mother, my mum always looks after me, she always cleans for me still, I'm 30 years of age but she cleans for me still. Whenever I go to work, when, I'm li when I go and visit mum, she always makes me brekkie like she always has. And I have all of these lovely things coming from my mum where she really loves me and enjoys my company and everything else. Can you see that if I don't, if I, what's going to happen to the woman who wants a relationship with me? She's going to be fighting my mother in a relationship. Can you see that? It's exactly what's going to be happening. Yep. It's an addiction that many parents have with their children. Yeah. 
Yeah, and often dads have it with their daughters because they don't have it with their wives and wives, uh, mothers have it with their sons because they don't have it with their husbands. Yeah, it's the idolisation of your male or female child in preference to your wife or, uh, or husband. It's, e it's e not only easier, but there's no sexual connotation in it generally. Um, it, um, we think there's no sexual... There, there are actually many sexual connotations in it, but, but we think there's no sexual connotation in it and so we think it's okay. But really what's happening is we're not getting, if, we're, if I'm the father doing it, I'm not actually really satisfied in my relationship with my partner and instead I'm getting my girl child to satisfy a lot of the things that my partner is not satisfying. And the same applies if I'm the male, uh, uh, the female, the mother in, in, with her son. I'm getting a lot of things from my son that my partner, my man partner is not satisfying in me. And it's a very, very damaging thing to do to your children. And, and it's very hard to disconnect from. And the reason why it's so hard is because the, the father or mother have, have given all these so-called loving feelings to that child all their life. And so the child actually believes that that's what love actually is when it's actually the father or mother in deep addiction to emotions that are not getting satisfied in their partnership. Yeah, it's very damaging to a relationship. And um, if we go to... Thanks, Mary. Um, I think you've actually cleared a few things that have been pondering in my head for a long time with my relationship with Layla's dad. Yep. Um, one of them was... Um, well, hang on. Uh, what you and Mary were just role-playing um, we had sort of the reverse thing. I wanted sex and he pulled back, but he kept flirting and everything with women constantly. And then I was insecure. And I think now that, uh, hang on, there was something there. Oh gosh, now I've lost it. But it, it sort of just came really clear to me where that maybe was coming from with him. Yeah. The other thing is uh, his ex-wife, I always and still feel she's in the picture. And the devastation you were just talking about of being afraid, uh, um, he was devastated before because she left him. And to be involved again, uh, that devastation, it doesn't want to really go there. The other thing is the mother. Can I stop you? Yeah, I'm talking too much. No, no, no. You're talking about the other person all the time and what their emotions are. Yeah. And you're not looking at your own. And yeah. And that's not going to help you. No, well, my next question was with the mother-in-law. How, yeah. how do you work with... How do you feel... Um, I, I, thank you. I, I hear that one. Yeah. Can you see, every time you focus on the other person and what their emotional injuries are, you're doing it for a reason. Now, there's usually a couple of reasons, right, that we do this. When we focus on the emotional injuries of the other person, we often are reframing everything, as Joy would say. We're reframing it so that we accept it inside of ourselves. And what we're actually doing at that moment is avoiding an emotional injury that's getting triggered in my side of myself if I didn't reframe it. So, if you, if you look at, all right, I'm looking at my ex-husband and what he does and he says and what he feels and all those things. Why am I doing that? I'm doing that because I want to avoid what I'm feeling from this. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to understand him so that my hurt is lesser than what it really is. Do you follow, do you yeah, follow that? Yeah. So, you see, the beauty of understanding other people and what they're doing is it helps me get away from the fact that what they did damn will hurt me. <laughs> Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I just don't want to feel the hurt of it. And so what I do is I explain to myself in detail, oh, they have that injury. Oh, isn't it so sad they have that injury? It's terrible. I understand now why that all happened in our relationship. And the truth is in that space you are not understanding because remember there's two people in the relationship and a law of attraction that's based on the soul condition of both people. So the only thing that's really going to help you 
in the future is to look at your emotions. Now your first sentence identified your emotion. And what was that? Can you remember the first sentence? I think you cleared up. It, uh, it was, no I don't. It was like the penny dropped. Yeah, the first sentence was actually, I felt, I was, you said I was the opposite to the example. I'm the one who wanted sex with my partner, is what you said. You remember that? Yeah. yeah. I'm the one who wanted sex with my partner. Now, you are needy for sexual attention from your partner, which mm -hmm. he, by the way, didn't give you, which mm -hmm. is your law of attraction. You were needy for sexual attention from your partner because the sexual attention helped you avoid some really deep emotions about being attractive and being you know, beautiful and special and things like that, that that you are yet to feel. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing to look at. That's the, that's the where to go. If you go down the other track of reframing everything of, oh, he did this and he did that and what's going on with his mother and all those different things, that's all fantastic for him if he was listening, but it does nothing okay. for you and your own emotions in terms of healing those with your relationship with God or healing those in relationship with any future partner. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Um, it's three o'clock now, so we might uh, have a break, shall we? 45 minute break and uh, come back about quarter four.